But when He, the Spirit of Truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. Welcome to Church at Home, the online ministry of St Andrew's Cathedral, Sydney, Australia. We're delighted that you've been able to join us. Please send us a line to our uh, website, sydneycathedral.com. We'd love to hear from you. In the church calendar, today is Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. The ascended Lord pours out his spirit on all his people in fulfillment of Old Testament promise. God gives his spirit to young and old, to men and women, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. The Holy Spirit, the personal presence of Jesus with his people, to be our comfort and joy, to empower and equip us for the works he's prepared for us to do, and to transform us into the likeness of the Lord. Across Australia, it's also National Reconciliation Week. We acknowledge that St Andrew's Cathedral stands on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. We grieve the loss of culture and language and story and the ongoing experience of injustice and inequality for far too many of our Indigenous brothers and sisters. We pay our respects to Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and emerging. And we send our greetings to Christian Indigenous leaders and friends of this cathedral, especially Uncle Ray Minikin, Auntie Jean Phillips and Uncle Neville Naden. Together at the foot of the cross, we pray that First Nations and all Australians may be made one in the bond of peace and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Good morning and welcome to St Andrew's Cathedral. This morning we gather together as God's people around his word to be encouraged, pray for our needs and praise God. Today especially we recall with all Christians God's gift to us at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. And this week at the Cathedral, we also acknowledge the ancestral people of our land as we recognise Reconciliation Week. And so we begin our time by praying in this way. Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the creator of all that is. We acknowledge that in your providence, you gave custodianship of the land upon which we meet to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We acknowledge with sorrow the painful history between the Aboriginal people and the later settlers of this land. And we pray that you may work among us the reconciliation that is the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We've come together to meet with God and to take our part in the building of his church. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we've been healed. Let us acknowledge our failure to serve him as he deserves and return to the Lord with repentance and faith, praying together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them for the sake of your son who died for us. Forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Give praise to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Friends, we join together in song, a prayer of thankfulness for the Holy Spirit.
as we turn to God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Joel 2, verse 20 to 32. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floor will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locusts swarm my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The New Testament reading is taken from John's Gospel, starting at chapter 15 and verse 26. Jesus said, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you 
what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us affirm with Christians across the ages what we believe about God and his love for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the Christian calendar, today is Pentecost. It marks the day, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, that the ascended Lord poured out his spirit on his disciples. They began to declare the mighty works of God in many languages. Peter preaches Jesus and 3,000 were baptized that day. The beginning of the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth for the blessing of every tribe and nation and language and people. No wonder they call it the birthday of the church. Jesus began to fulfill what he had promised to his disciples on the night of his arrest. As we've just heard, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus has sent the spirit and he describes the ministry of the spirit this way in verse 14, he will glorify me. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus by shining the light on his words and works, his salvation and sovereignty, his rule and return through the testimony of the apostles. The Anglican pastor and theologian J.I. Packer calls it the floodlight ministry of the spirit. If you walk around this cathedral at night, there are certain points where its arches and buttresses and architectural features are illumined by floodlights. And where the light shines, you can see the grandeur of this esteemed edifice. And Packer says, the spirit is like a floodlight, not drawing attention to himself, except by the work of making known the glory of Jesus. Work that is the work of the spirit from beginning to end. The Spirit in chapter 14, reminding the apostles of all that Jesus had taught them. Chapter 15, testifying to Jesus through the testimony of the apostles. Chapter 16, the Spirit convicting the world, the Spirit guiding the apostles into all the truth, anticipating the Spirit breathed scriptures which make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus and convict, convince, correct, train and encourage God's people today. On the night of his arrest, we hear Jesus speak of the ministry of the promised Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. Three times in the passage, Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, chapter 15, verse 26, when the Spirit comes, he will testify about me. Chapter 16, verse 8, when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment. And verse 13, when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth, making known to the apostles what he receives from Jesus. The Spirit's work, to testify to the truth about Jesus, to convict the world of the truth about Jesus, and to guide the apostles into all the truth made known in Jesus. First, the testimony of Jesus. Chapter 15, verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me 
from the beginning. Pentecost marks the fulfillment of the Old Testament promise that God will pour out His Spirit on all His people, young and old, male and female, and indeed He does. Whenever someone believes the gospel, they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. But here it's the night of Jesus' arrest. He's speaking to those 11 apostles who were specially chosen and commissioned by him to be eyewitnesses and ear witnesses of his ministry. Jesus says he will send the Spirit to you because you have been with me from the beginning. And in verse 13 of chapter 16, Jesus says, the Spirit will guide you because I have more to say than you, that you cannot bear at this time. Jesus is speaking about the particular ministry of the Spirit to the apostles, precisely because when they begin to testify, they'll attract opposition and persecution. Verse 2, they'll put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God. The existence of the Christian church is a mystery. Peter denies the Lord three times. When Jesus is crucified, the disciples all flee for their lives. When Jesus is buried, they lock themselves into a room, fearful that they'll be arrested. But just a few weeks later, Peter and the apostles stand up to the Sanhedrin to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus, saying, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. They knew they were not alone, as they bore witness to Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord. When the Spirit of truth comes, he gives them voice. The Spirit does not come to bear witness to himself. The apostles do not proclaim the Spirit, but by the Spirit, the apostles proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And through the apostles' testimony, the Spirit glorifies Jesus, from whom he has received what he has made known to the apostles. He will testify about me, Jesus says, and you also must testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Second, it's the ministry of the Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In verse eight, Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, the word translated prove to be in the wrong has uh, levels of meaning. To prove the world to be in the wrong is to expose the world, to convict the world. Uh, proving has a uh, kind of logical flavor to it. Convict, the word used in some other translations, captures the idea of a prosecution, but also of a change of heart. Not just wrong, but guilty. Not just mistaken, but responsible. When the Spirit comes, he will convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. When someone becomes a Christian, that always involves thinking differently about sin and righteousness and judgment. And only the Spirit of God can bring about a change like that. When the Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, verse nine, because people do not believe in me. What does the world say about sin? Well, it says there's no such thing. It's all relative. It's just cultural. It's lack of opportunity, lack of education, or it's the parents' fault. But if the world does, does concede that there is sin, then it says it's doing bad things. But what does the Spirit say sin is? People do not believe in Jesus. The Spirit exposes the sin of rejecting Jesus, who alone makes God known. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Whoever rejects the Son rejects the one who sent me. It's the Spirit's work to convict us that we are people who by nature and choice reject God's love, fail to give him thanks, assert our own right to live in our own way in defiance of God, pretending that we have created our own selves and are accountable to no one. What is the punishment that fits the crime of rejecting Jesus? It is, of course, to be rejected by Jesus. But instead, Jesus is going to the cross, to the place of rejection for our sakes. He goes there to prepare a welcome in his Father's house for those who believe in him. When Jesus dies on the cross, he is rejected so that we can be received. He bears the curse so that we may receive the gift. 
When you see in the cross the penalty paid for your sin, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Spirit to convict the world in regard to sin because people do not believe in Jesus. Verse 10, it's the work of the Spirit to prove the world wrong in regard to righteousness because Jesus is going to the Father where he is seen no longer. In Jesus' day, the self-righteous condemned him for healing on the Sabbath instead of rejoicing in the liberty and healing he brought to those he healed. The self-righteous condemned him for blasphemy, though they themselves profiteered in the temple and prevented others from praying. Self-righteousness is without compassion and full of condemnation. And as Christianity has taken a back seat in Western culture, self-righteousness has asserted itself in spades. Social media has created an instant, constant and global platform for self-righteous self-congratulation and merciless criticism of whoever is deemed today's outsider. The spirit of truth testifies, glorifies, shines the light on Jesus, the righteous one, the man who offered grace to the sinner, hope to the helpless, life to the dead in sin, the man whose words were without peer, whose works were the works of God, whose life reflected the glory of God, the righteous one. Jesus has gone to the Father because he alone is righteous. Who can ascend to the Lord's holy mountain? The psalmist asks, no one but the righteous. Jesus says, no one can come to the Father except through me. We have no right of access of our own. We wholly depend on the righteousness of Jesus. Left to ourselves, we're inclined to think that our righteousness is robust and impressive and shining. But when we meet Jesus, we realize it's puny and pathetic and weak. That is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, the Holy Spirit proves the world wrong about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The world thinks there is no judgment and the proof is that the wicked get away with it. Look at the cross, the world says. The prince of this world, the devil, reigned at the cross his finest hour, or so he thought. But in reality, the cross was the fatal blow leveled at his dominion. The cross sounds the death knell over the reign of Satan and rings in the kingdom of the Son. Judgment belongs to Jesus and he'll bring judgment on the prince of this world and all those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord. God has appointed Jesus judge of all and given notice of it by raising him from the dead. Now is the time for repentance, for turning to Christ. But only the Spirit of God can convince and convict you of that. It's his work in the secret places of our hearts. Does that mean we don't have a role? Not at all. The Spirit is poured out on young and old, on men and women, on children and grown-up disciples so that they may testify to Jesus. And the work of the Spirit in the hearts of people is propelled by the prayers of God's people. Please spend time praying for people in whom you desire the Holy Spirit to do his work of bringing conviction about Jesus. And pray that the Spirit would do, continue to do that work in your own heart, convicting us when we fail to acknowledge Jesus, to trust in him and do his will, when we lapse into self-righteous pride and condemning, when we forget that our only refuge in the judgment is Jesus who went to the cross for our sakes. Pray that the spirit of truth would bring conviction to people's hearts, change hearts, change perspectives, bring repentance and confession and faith in Christ in us and in others. Third, the Spirit shines the light of Jesus' glory as he guides the apostles into all the truth. Verse 13, I have more to say to you than you can bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
Jesus has already said in chapter 14 that the Spirit will remind the disciples of everything that Jesus has said to them. And here he says the Spirit will guide the apostles into all the truth. Understanding of the events of Jesus' life and ministry, including his imminent death and resurrection and ascension, the significance of his actions and words, truth to shape the life of his church, truth about his return and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. Notice the comprehensiveness of the Spirit's guidance. The Spirit will guide them into all the truth, verse 13 says. Verse 15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. The Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. He will not speak on his own, but only what he hears from me. All that the Father gives to the Son, the Son will make known to the Spirit to reveal to the apostles. Here is the source of Christian confidence in the sufficiency of the apostles' testimony, the sufficiency of Scripture. Disciples facing a hostile world will be guided by all the truth made known to the apostles by the Spirit of truth. Can I make three more brief observations about the implications of the Spirit's ministry in this way. First, God is fulfilling his plans. The pouring out of the Spirit is part of the unfolding plan of God's salvation. When the prophet Joel uttered the words of his prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus, he could hardly have imagined how they would be fulfilled. Jesus promised to give his disciples his Spirit to be with them, to help them and guide them and to enable and empower their ministry. The Spirit continues to do all that work today while we wait for the future fulfilment of Jesus' promise to establish the kingdom where there is no more dying or crying or pain and every tear is wiped away. As the Spirit convicts individuals today through the preaching of the gospel, that day comes nearer. Second, Spirit-filled disciples suffer still. The life that is filled with the power and the presence of the Spirit is not for that reason a life that is shielded from sorrow and suffering. No, Jesus' words to the disciples that they be thrown out of the synagogue and even put to death also came true. And that remains the experience of many Christians today across the globe. The Spirit does not save us from trouble in the world, but he is with us in trouble and sorrow to strengthen God's people for their witness and work in the world, whatever the cost. Third, we must not separate what God puts together. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth who testifies about Jesus and empowers the testimony of the apostles. The Spirit carries along the authors of Scripture, 2 Peter says, and breathes out the Scriptures, 2 Timothy says, who convicts the world as the word is preached so that people are cut to the heart repent and are baptised. The word of truth is breathed out by the spirit of truth. The word is the sword of the spirit. The word and spirit are inseparable in scripture and so should be in our own lives and ministries. The ministry of the spirit of truth, to testify, to convict and to guide. In all that the spirit does, what is his aim? To glorify Jesus. It is the Spirit who testifies. Look to Jesus, run to Jesus, welcome him. It is the Spirit who brings conviction. Jesus will deal with your sin. Jesus will give you his righteousness. Jesus rescues us from the coming judgment. It is the Spirit who guides us into all the truth. See Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. beyond all measure 
that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which man the chosen one bring many sons to glory. We turn to God in prayer. The prayer set for today. Almighty God, who taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant to us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and always to rejoice in his holy comfort through the merits of Christ Jesus our Saviour, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, this week has been Reconciliation Week, and today we begin by praying a prayer written by our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Holy Father, God of love, you are the creator of this land and of all good things. We acknowledge the pain and shame of our history and the suffering of our peoples, and we ask your forgiveness. We thank you for the survival of Indigenous cultures, our hope is in you because you gave your son Jesus to reconcile the world to you. We pray for your strength and grace to forgive, accept and love one another as you love us and forgive and accept us in the sacrifice of your son. Give us the courage to accept the realities of our history so that we may build a better future for our nation. 
Teach us to respect all cultures. Teach us to care for our land and waters. Help us to share justly the resources of this land. Help us to bring about spiritual and social change to improve the quality of life for all groups in our communities, especially the disadvantaged. Help young people find true dignity and self-esteem by your spirit. May your power and love be the foundations on which we build our families, our communities and our nation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of grace, we bring before you the indigenous ministries here in Sydney and further afield and ask for your blessing upon them. We pray for Scarred Tree Indigenous Church in Glebe, asking that you would comfort and sustain families at this time as many have lost jobs and livelihoods during the pandemic. We pray also for Living Water in Redfern, Mount Druitt Indigenous Church and Shoalhaven Aboriginal Church. Please strengthen and sustain your leaders in those places as they disciple our brothers and sisters during this difficult time. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray for this cathedral and the ministry it provides under you for your people. And as we conduct our AGM today, we ask for your spirit's guidance in all matters and decisions. We pray for our Archbishop, Regional Bishop and the Cathedral Chapter as they exercise oversight during this strange time when great wisdom is required to plan the next stage in the Cathedral's ministry here in Sydney. And gracious Lord, as we celebrate Pentecost, we thank you for the gift of your spirit, which was given to the disciples, filling them with joy and empowering them to preach the gospel. We also, as followers of Christ, have received that same spirit to teach us, convict us, remind and renew us. By his power, equip us to carry out the work prepared by you, to witness to your redeeming love and to draw people to you. We ask this through Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And would you join with me as we say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In Acts chapter 2 we read, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to tell the mighty works of God. Let us pray. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, your patience and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your Spirit to honour you in our thoughts, words and actions, and to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> 